Illinois. He sits on the Intelligence Committee and also co-chair of the Congressional Ukraine Caucus. Good to have you here, my friend. Let's get into this. First thing, you were on the call this morning with Ukrainian President Zelensky. From what you can tell us, what was his message and what is your assessment on the current situation? You know, Alex, we're going back to work on Monday in Washington, D.C. to consider a $10 billion aid package, humanitarian and defense purposes. Uh, this was the ultimate lack of a better way to describe it, a pep talk. Um, you couldn't help be moved uh, by the president's demeanor, calm, powerful, appreciative. Uh, I'm no stenographer, but I took notes. And uh, it's just, it's hard to put into words. The, the things he said, he said at the end, uh, we are all one big army, undefeatable. We represent an ideal unity worth fighting for. If we win, it's a victory over injustice. You are our biggest hope. Help us. Don't let our people be exterminated. Woof. That is, uh, it is courage that he is embodying there and an element of leadership that is remarkable. What was the reaction there and what did he specifically ask for? Uh, I, I think you, you can't not be moved yeah. when you know what he's going through. He, he sort of matter-of-factly recognized the fact that they're coming to kill him. Um, in history, what do we compare this with? Uh, at the top of my mind, Churchill during the Blitz, but it, it, for the, its immediate sake, clearly uh, President Zelensky is at greater risk and, and seems to be raising the stakes. I think what you could take from this is uh, you know, sometimes nothing happens in a decade, the old proverb, and sometimes 10 years happens in a week. We have seen the West move very dramatically, uh, where Switzerland's not neutral, and Germany is, and the EU are doing things that they wouldn't have thought they'd do. Uh, I think moments like this accelerate that time frame. So when he asks for planes, if we're not going to do air, uh, uh, an air zone, uh, you have to listen. And if he asks for enhanced sanctions on the energy sector, on credit cards, not making the typical uh, Russian's life so comfortable, you got to listen. Yeah. Um, I just want to be real clear for our viewers, something um, just technically speaking, we are showing pictures of Zelensky addressing a body. That was when he addressed the EU, not addressing Congress this morning. He did get a standing ovation when he was addressing the EU, well, which brings and his me to... response was extraordinary today. I'm sorry. I want to make no, sure no, no. that was clear. And, and, I, and I agree. And it, I feel I, I know you well enough to kind of be able to read you. I feel like you're really moved by what you heard as well. Let me put it this way. Uh, my grandfather fought in the First World War, was gassed in the trenches, and suffered that the rest of his life. What he's talking about is why millions gave their last full measure of devotion to beat this kind of autocratic form. There is, we prefaced everything we've talked about with this situation with this, well, Ukraine's not a member of NATO. But if any American watched the president of Ukraine today speak, you would have to take away the president's actions and his people's actions and who they are as a sovereign democratic country. This is exactly why we formed NATO. So I think it's a moving picture. The last thing I want to do is tell Putin, here's the limits of what we'll do. Now, I don't suggest that that means that we're going to remove the no-fly zone immediately. But I do think it means we need to get him planes right away. And if that's Eastern European planes, his people know how to fly, all the better. And if we need to shut down their energy sector, we need to do that. Um, as kids, we watched films of the Blitzkrieg. And n none of us ever thought that we could allow something like that to happen again. Well, it's happening. And uh, today was one of those moments when you, you reminded yourself that uh, uh, we have a job to do as Western democracies. I had a very interesting conversation with a former member of the Ukrainian parliament, and she 
made a proposal, and I don't know if it even possible, but she suggested, her name's Svetlana, she suggested that foreign fighters could very easily get Ukrainian citizenship and jump in planes that are being provided by the United States and everybody else and get up in the air and fight as Ukrainians with planes that are sent by the United States and, and European partners. When she said it at first, I thought, well, that, does that make sense? I mean, does it make sense to you? Even more so, would Vladimir Putin read it as such? Doesn't matter if they were Americans or French or Dutch or Swedish, whoever came. Would would Vladimir Putin see that and, and be able to say, well, I guess they are Ukrainians? Or would he say, yet? <laughs> No, he would see it as he has said that, how, as he uh, described the sanctions as an act of war and a dramatic escalation. So it, it's easy to get caught up in um, how this is moving forward. And I don't think you can ignore that because it, the, the spirit of why we formed NATO and we fought the Second World War and, and tried to win the war, the battle after the war, right, uh, with the airlift and so much more that we did to rebuild Europe and keep it. And uh, all the af aspects of the Cold War. Um, so uh, I, I think we have to understand that everything's on the table and on an accelerated basis discern what is the most effective way uh, that saves the Ukrainian people while not uh, escalating us dramatically into a third world war. Look, we, we are seeing in real time Russia slowly taking over these smaller surrounding cities to Kyiv and other major hubs. Is it inevitable that Russia will take Kyiv, even if later than expected? Uh, you know, I, I can't ever bet against the Ukrainian people. I recognize the situation as you described it. Um, I would say this, even if they were to take over the major cities and put up some sort of prop up a puppet government like Belarus, um, that the insurgency would never end. And um, in the end, it's a war that Putin could never win. So, OK, conceivably, he could take the cities. He can install a government that no one can so especially the Ukrainians would recognize. But there is no way he will beat the Ukrainian people. It's just impossible. He doesn't have the resources to do that, and no one can change that. And at the same time, you know, while the world changes, the scenery is changing behind us as well. Uh, back to the initial point, uh, I think the world is, is evolving how it reacts to this. And yeah, it can't just be the people who are involved now. In the final analysis, we need Israel, we need India, we need China, we need OPEC to all recognize this and completely isolate Putin. That is a nearly impossible task, but uh, our friends in Ukraine deserve the effort. Yeah. Congressman Mike, quickly, got to say, I'm grateful to call you a friend and to have you and your moral compass, your decency, well. your experience in Congress. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. You're going to hear it from Ukrainians. You're